Yo guys, welcome back to the Uncle Sharma channel. You know what time it is. Tomorrow, into 8.45 uh, Italian time, playing Benevento. So we're here to preview that match, seeing if Inter can close up the two-point gap at the top of the table from AC Milan. Obviously, coming in from a uh, you know victory in the Milan derby uh, just the just the other day, a Christian Eriksen goal, still gassed, you know, getting revenge on those guys. But before we get onto that, just gotta discuss something about the transfer market. Surprisingly, we thought it was going to be the deadest January transfer market, which has been in general for the whole of football. You know, the COVID situation, general you know financial trouble. Everyone's in. No one's really moving. No one's really buying anyone. And that's what we expected for Inter pretty much. Uh, and that's what it's been until yesterday. Di Marzio, Gazzetta, Corriere dello Sport, all of those, you know, outlets, uh, you know, flagged up that Inter and uh, Roma are discussing a swap rumor, um, a swap deal for uh, Alexis Sanchez and Edin Dzeko. Now, Edin Dzeko is a, uh, you know, he's, he's unwanted right now at Roma. He's falling out with the with the Fonseca the the Roma coach you know they had a falling out after their Coppa Italia match uh, against Spezia where you know the, that six substitution thing happened where Roma somehow you know these guys you know if you think drama happens at Inter these guys are much worse than Inter these guys are absolute amateurs when it comes to creating you know a stable club because there's, there's always some sort of drama going on off the field for them and, you know, they made those six substitutions. And apparently, Dzeko said some strong words to Fonseca after the match. And Fonseca has not reintegrated him with the team. Dzeko's training on his own. So, Roma, you know, obviously now they have to, you know, the most highest paid player, their club captain right now. And they, they have to try to get rid of him. And they, they're they trying to get this uh, swap with Alexis Sanchez on because they both have similar wages. And Inter... As you know, Antonio Conte, Edin Dzeko is one of those players that he's been obsessed with for a long, long time. We've been linked with Dzeko since Antonio Conte has come to the club. We were linked with him when we were trying to buy, you know, uh, Lukaku. He was one of the alternatives. And even when we signed Lukaku, there was a strong, strong indication that Dzeko was wanted by Conte to partner Lukaku. So he wanted those two big guys up front to partner Lukaku. And we know that Lukaku... In the past, has said himself, he's, he said that he's not a target man player. That's not how he likes to play. So he's had to change his way of playing when he's come to Inter in this Conte system where, you know, he's uh, there's been talks, you know, he's admitted that, you know, Conte trained him to play with his back to go. He put a Nokia in training, you know, uh, marking him. And every single time, you know, he would lose the ball. It was a bad touch. They would restart the training. You know, someone would, you know, fire the ball into him with a Nokia pressing him from behind and he would have to hold it up and pass it off or whatever. And, you know, he's, he's improved so much in that, in that, in that way. You know, the touch thing, you know, was the main criticism with Lukaku when he first came. He's got a bad touch, got a bad touch. Tim's Kaku, Brick Kaku. But, you know, Fair play to the guy. He's improved that a lot. But his game, he's always said he wants to face the goal. He doesn't want to have his back to go. He wants to be facing the goal. We've seen he's got those uh, tendencies to drift out to the right to try cut in with the left, almost like a, you know, a little bit of a winger. Even though he has got the he's got the build of a big target man, so it doesn't really make sense. But that's how he's played. You know, that's how he played at Everton. That's how why it didn't really work out at Man United because he was that lone striker up front and he didn't really he couldn't really play that role. But so in Antonio Conte's mind, there's always been that Jacku Lukaku partnership, and he, he's been linked with the, with us uh, for a while. So in in that the, in that sense, it does make sense. As Sanchez, um, we've seen that you know he's very very useful in this team, but injury prone, very injury prone, and we can see that here. I'm going to pull up the uh, injury history for both players, Jacku and Sanchez, uh, on transfer market. First off, we'll start with Edin Dzeko. He's 34 years old. He's going to be 35 in uh, in March. So already, you know, the, that's already a bit of a drawback in terms of this deal. Uh, we already know the average age of this team is already a bit on the high side. We're already complaining, you know, that the players that we're signing are all retirees or, you know, about to get retired. You know, what is this pension FC? So that doesn't help in that sense because, you know, he's a guy that's pretty much reaching the end of his career. But... Unlike Sanchez, who's, you know, three years younger than him, he's physically very dependable. You know, at Roma, he's been the main guy ever since he was signed from Man City. You know, he had that first season where he struggled, but after that, he's been, you know, one of the best strikers in the Serie A, without a doubt. And he hardly ever misses a match, even though he's he has to play pretty much every single match, you know. Since he's played at Roma, you know, very, very few matches where he's had to miss. You know, in the last year, 
he's only missed one game really because of that bruise. And then, I mean, coronavirus, you know, it's, uh, that could happen to anyone. But in terms of actual, you know, muscular injury, very, very rare, very, very dependable. We take a look at Sanchez, you know, 32 years old now, as I said, three years younger than him. But in terms of injuries, ever since, let's take, you know, start off in 18 19 from his Man United days, you know, missing eight, two games, eight games, two games, you know, all these little muscular injuries, knee injury, ankle injury. And then the Inter, there was a big one they needed surgery on when he first came. Uh, you know, pretty much, you know, ruined his beginning of the his career at Inter. But ever since then as well, whenever there's like a, you know, international break, he seems to get injured. It's always a worry when he goes off with Chile. So in that sense, you know, in terms of dependability and what, you know, Conte wants in his team, it makes sense to bring uh, someone like uh, Dzeko in. And obviously in terms of goal scoring as well, you know, Dzeko is a proper, proper striker unlike, you know, Sanchez. Who's, you know, I've said it many times in my uh, match reactions and reviews and previews that, you know, for me, Sanchez now is basically, you know, trequartista. You know, he, he's really lost that touch with the goal, you know, at, at Arsenal, at Barcelona, you know, with the Nays. This guy used to score, you know, 10, 15 plus goals a season, even 20 plus at Arsenal. You know, he was becoming a, a real, you know, he was becoming a goal scorer. But ever since then, you know, he's, he's been really downhill in terms of his goal contributions at Inter now. You know, even when he gets in goal scoring positions, I just have zero confidence in him. We saw even when he gets the penalties, there's zero confidence in him. You know, he hardly ever takes shots from outside the box. You know, even when he does, it, they don't they don't have that zing, they don't have that power that they once used to have. You know, this guy used to score bangers back in the day, but now unless it's a tap in, I'm really not expecting much of a goal uh, from Sanchez. Whereas with the Jeco, yes, he has been on a decline. Yes, you know, we talk about Lautaro missing chances, Jeco also misses a, a lot of chances probably even more than Lautaro he's never been a, a clinical finisher Edin Dzeko but he scores goals even this season you see here you know 20 appearances eight goals still and this is you know it's supposed to be a bad season for for Dzeko and he's not even you know in this, this is the way Roma play now he's not even the main you know finishing point of the of the move he's the one who comes a little bit deeper and uh, you know brings other pl people into play and he's even better than Lukaku at doing that. You know, his touch has always been really good for a big man. He's always been really good at, you know, bringing, coming a bit deeper and, and putting through balls or trying to link up with his with his teammates. He's always been very, very underrated to me. Uh, proper, proper old school centre forward, but with modern attributes. Whereas with Sanchez, you see here, you know, 19 appearances, most of them, you know, as substitute, two goals, four assists, you know, but last year, he ended up with, uh, I think, four goals and 10 assists, which, uh, you know, is another good return. But in terms of goal scoring, you know, he plays in that second striker role, but he really doesn't really provide much of a goal threat at all. Uh, but, you know, assist machine in the last year after the lockdown period, he was uh, in the whole of Europe. He was the highest assister, which was super impressive. And that was probably the best period of Sanchez we've seen, which brings me on to, you know, the drawbacks of this possible deal which is, you know, he is the only one with these kind of characteristics, you know, he's the only one that makes these risky passes in the team, you know, obviously Ericsson was supposed to be brought in to do those kind of, you know, risky passes, trying to, you know, create those chances from, you know, difficult positions, but Sanchez is the one, you know, he's the one who tries to dribble out of difficult positions, he's the one, you know, who tries to create things out of nothing, you know, you see here, even in the last match, he was, he created these situations there, 1v1 against the centre-backs of Milan, there was one way he did it against Kessi, and here, Simon Kayer, you know, got done over by uh, by Sanchez really nicely, back heel, and then he was injured after that, you know, Simon Kaya, you know, that could have been a very uh, interesting situation he created. You know, he's got that ability of creating something out of nothing. And he also, if he leaves, it takes away Inter's opportunity of having that plan B, which we saw against uh, AC Milan. So you can see here when we uh, switch to the 4-3-1-2 against AC Milan in the second, uh, in the second half, uh, with Kolarov, you know, going to left back and then... Uh, Barella, Brozovic, Vidal in midfield and, you know, you see Sanchez there, he was playing behind behind uh, Lautaro and uh, Lukaku after Lautaro came on, which is something that we wouldn't be able to do anymore. And you can see here also in terms of key passes, uh, who scored shows, you know, Sanchez is the one that does the most, uh, attempts the most key, key passes in the whole team. You know, as I was saying, someone that tries risky passes. And in terms of dribbles as well, so if we filter it down by um, by dribbles, uh, let's go for total dribbles. 
You see Lukaku, Hakimi, Martinez and then Sanchez and then successful. There he is. He's right just behind the Lukaku in terms of successful dribbles. So it's someone that, you know, we, it's, it's something that already we're lacking with a team that dribbles the least in the whole of Serie A. It's a fact. It's not just my feeling. It's an actual fact that Inter are the least dribbling team in the whole of Serie A. So when you take out the one, you know, Maverick or, you know, the one Mercurial character that can give you that 1v1 ability, that creation ability from nothing so and you bring on oh, someone that's a lot more static in uh, Edin Dzeko he's not going to take on players he's not going to beat anyone for pace especially now that he's 34 going on to 35 years old so you, you're bringing on someone that's even more static it makes you even more predictable but I guess gives you that cross the inshallah ability someone that's better than Lukaku is in the air better at holding up the ball so you know there's there's, there's a pros and cons to, to this deal but overall if it was for me, you know, if it's if it was about me, you know, in theory, I like, you know, the most technical players as possible. You know, put every single technical player in the team as possible. You know, Eriksen, Sensi, Sanchez. You know, that's that's that. Those are the types of players I like. But for Conte and Conte's system, and you know, because I've said in the past, whenever Conte has wanted a person, even if it's been Ashley Young, Mattel Damian, you know, I've had my doubts about them. But I say, if he wants them bring him in and you know he always shows that you know in the end they do work out you know we've seen with Darmian this season we've seen with Ashley Young not this season but last season you know when he wants these these players in Lukaku he was obsessed with Lukaku you know he had this fetish with Lukaku and we've seen he's managed to turn him into an even better player so when it comes to this this swap I am in favor of it but I am sad that we would lose someone with the ability of Alexis Sanchez at the same time but ultimately as has been kind of confirmed today it doesn't look like this this swap is happening and I tweeted out yesterday when it was first announced first first of all financially it doesn't quite work out with Inter we've said nothing can come in with unless you know in terms of wage budget nothing can move up or you know salaries or you know cost of a salary cost of staff nothing can move upwards you know inter at the moment have got their hands tied because of the chinese government i've said to you guys it's not that we're broke it's like you know technically we are broke because we can't spend but it's not that assuming a poor it's just that the giant chinese government now has you know stopped all you know foreign spending so Suning can't spend anything. So anything that has to come in has to be, you know, same level. So Jekyll unfortunately earns slightly more than uh, than Sanchez. They're both on around seven million net a year. But Sanchez, um, there's a law in Italy that helps with foreign players. Uh, it's called the Growth Decree, the Credito di Crescita, that you know helps with the taxes. And uh, you know I don't want to bore you guys with the details, but basically there's a difference of about three million. In gross wages that you know need to be made up there were rumors that Pina Monti could be sent to them or even you know Radu someone you know to offset the difference or something like that but in the end looks like it's not going to happen as, as I expected and I'm happy about it as I said you know I like the fact that Sanchez brings that plan B and he brings that unpredictability into the team but hopefully he improves with same with Sensi same as Sensi you know hopefully he stays a bit more fit physically because you know we need that reliability the, the season is getting difficult now. The fixtures are going to start piling up once again. But as I said, those were my thoughts on the uh, Jaco Sanchez possible rumours. You guys let me know in the comments below what your thoughts are. But now, moving on to the Inter Benevento match preview. As you know, guys, now pretty much every single match is becoming a must win if you want to keep up with AC Milan, not dropping that many points. But they have started to, you know, the, 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 there's a bit of a chink in the armour. You know, Inter, Juve beat them, then Inter beat them. Uh, Atalanta also beat them so you know they've had three losses now in the last four matches um, so it really is important to keep up that pressure and obviously if you have matches like these these are the ones that you have to have to win against the likes of Benevento who have been one of the surprises of the season actually you know Inter smashed them in the first match 5-2 if you remember it was uh, Ashraf Hakimi you know showing, showing himself uh, for the first time properly to Inter fans and to the world uh, killing that right hand side and that's what we're expecting in the expected uh, lineup for tomorrow in the formation Hakimi returning to start in after a disappointing showing from Matteo Darmian in the Coppa Italia probably is worth showing in the Inter shirt until now um, normal defence returns apart from Ranocchi in the middle so De Vrij gets a rest which is good he hasn't got a rest recently Bastoni got a rest last match uh, so this time De Vrij gets it which is good and he, they all 
need to get a turn of rest each. Unfortunately, Skriniar doesn't get one, but D'Ambrosio is he's on his way back soon. Hopefully, in the couple of, next couple of weeks, he'll come back and be able to give Skriniar a little bit of rest in some of the matches. But the big surprise, as you can see, right in the middle there, Christian Eriksen is rumored to be starting at the Regista position. Couldn't confirm pretty much that he's that's the position that he's going to play in for the rest of the season now because we don't have a vice Brozovic and that's the position that he's been working with Eriksen in training and uh, you know he's, he's he's shown some decent signs there we saw him you know for 120 minutes against the uh, uh, Fiorentina and the Coppa he was decent there nothing outstanding but nothing too bad which is pretty much you know the the summary of Eriksen's career at Inter I've never felt like he's had an awful match at Inter he just never really moved the needle so I'm not really expecting once again I'm not really expecting him to have a a world-class match but it's good for Brozovic to get a rest and yeah it's good for Ericsson you know you have to I keep saying you need to make use of this whole squad I don't care if you don't rate Ericsson you need to make use of him you know he's seven and a half million net a year and he's losing value if you just keep him on the bench so you gotta you gotta make use of uh, you know these kind of type of players I'm happy to see Ericsson hopefully you know that free kick goal last minute free kick winner gives him some confidence to you know get more you know try a few more things try more risky passes in the team Barella you know you know these this guy poor guy he just has to play every single match but Vidal once again starting the fourth match in a row uh this is a little bit of a decision that I don't agree with I didn't want him to start against Milan actually because I thought three matches in a row is already pushing it with him because we've seen he's already not you know the same Vidal that he was a few years ago and if you play him if you keep you know churning him and really you know, turning him into a smoothie, try you know, getting every single minute out of him is, is not going to be good for his performances. As we saw earlier on the season, I would rather see, even though it, um, it makes me laugh saying it, but I would rather see Gagliardini or even Stefano Sensi if he's ready, you know, to see, to see him starting. But yeah, it's Conte, it's Vidal, you know, those two are like this. So what can we do? It is what it is. But on the left-hand side, I'm happy to see even Perisic starting. You know, as I said, against Fiorentina in the Coppa, he was really good for me. And against Milan, the first half, I thought he was really good. And he dipped off. And in general, as I've said, to me, I I'm slightly prefer him over Ashley Young this season, even though, you know, they've both been pretty bad, to be fair, to overall. But I feel like, you know, Perisic does provide a little bit extra in that attacking half. And up front, Martinez, Lukaku returning, the Lula, obviously, uh, with Sanchez. We don't know how his, you know, physical and mental state will be in terms of you know with all these rumors going around but you know Lukaku Martinez I'm happy with those two starting obviously we need Lautaro to come back to the goals he hasn't scored since the Crotone match um you know I still have faith in him to you know turn his season around you know it's not been that bad you know eight goals in the in the in the, in the Serie A is not that bad at all but if he's not careful, Hakimi, on, he's on six goals. He might catch up with the Lautaro soon. So, yeah, he needs Lautaro. He needs to start scoring again. And it's been confirmed that pretty much uh, him and Bastoni, there seems to be an agreement on the new contract, which is great, great news. So sick, man. Obviously, Bastoni, you know, you need to tie that guy down and make sure no Premier League or big clubs come looking for sniffing around. Lautaro, he's earned a new contract, but we'll see what the figures are because it, it rumours that he was asking for around six or seven million, you know, top player wages. But it, it looks like the agreement will come around five million wages, which, you know, if you're going to ask for Barcelona for 70, 80 million, you have to kind of, that's how it works. If you're valuing a player at 70, 80 million, you have to give him the wages of a 70, 80 million player. In terms of Benevento, you know, the deal, we played them last time, you know, they played the three they play a 4-3-1-2 formation or 4-3-2-1, sorry. Uh, Caprari, you know, former Inter player, but never actually played for Inter. Um, you know, he's been one of their best, if not their best player this season. Um, you know, they're, they're a pretty in interesting team to play. As I said, all the teams have come up this season. Uh, they play nice football. They're not, you know, sit back and defend deep type teams. As we saw Benevento in the first match, you know, uh, Filippo Inzaghi likes his teams to attack. Um, but they're not particularly high scorers as they don't really have, you know, a proper, you know, good striker up front. Lapadula, you know, is a top scorer, but he's not particularly the most clinical player out there. Um, so overall, I'm pretty confident into getting the job done here. I'm, I'm predicting a 2-1 uh, victory. I don't think it'll be a, a washout. We've got a very, very busy period up ahead. You know, courtesy of IFTV, I have the Inter schedule 
for the period of February, very, very busy, obviously now, thanks to the Coppa Italia advancement, you know, it was looking like it was going to be on a, you know, a bit easier just last week when I was talking about it. But now, now that we are through to the next stage of Coppa Italia, everything's getting, you know, packed. You got Juventus once again after Benevento on the second in the Coppa Italia. And, you know, that's on two legs, by the way. Lukaku and Hakimi are out for the first leg. Then Fiorentina Friday 5th. Then Juventus again for their second leg. Then Lazio, Milan, you know, all of these after after Benevento, all of these are big matches, you know, Fiorentina, maybe not so much, but still, it's a difficult month up ahead for, for Inter. Hoping Conte keeps to rotate the team, keeps everyone on the toes, keeps, you know, everyone involved and, you know, doesn't, you know, squeeze every single minute out of Barella, Brozovic, Vidal, especially the midfield guys, you know, those guys. You know they'd run a lot, so I hope you know Conte's learned his lesson from last from last year. Because finally now, as we see from our you know infirmary, finally he is getting empty. You know D'Ambrosio is out right now; should be back in the next couple of weeks. But you know Vecino's back, played with the um, with the Primavera yesterday, scored a goal and assisted. So he's slowly on his way back. So we're getting there. So hopefully you know Conte doesn't <laughs> play everyone too much and then they get injured. But yeah, two-one victory for me. My prediction. You guys let me know in the comments below what your prediction is, your thoughts on Alexis Sanchez, Jekyll rumors, do you reckon we can catch up with uh, Milan at the top? And obviously, guys, make sure to leave a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't, if you're new to the channel. And I'll see you for the post-match reaction tomorrow night. Ciao ragazzi and forza Inter!